Hi, my name is Jen Balava. I'm the lead naturalist for Burlington County Parks. This presentation is all about birds of prey, also known as raptors, which include vultures, hawks and eagles, falcons, and owls. Now, just to be clear, there are other birds that are predators. Birds like herons, egrets, kingfishers, certain kinds of diving ducks and shrikes, they all eat animals too. But the birds of prey that we're talking about in this presentation are also known as raptors. They have special adaptations for catching, tearing, and eating meat. As you can see in the pictures, they have hooked beaks, talons, which are the name for the claws on their feet, and they have unbelievably keen eyesight. And in general, female raptors are larger than their male counterparts. Before I go into individual species profiles, I just want to highlight hawk migration in New Jersey because it's, it's really fascinating. If you look at the geography of New Jersey, you'll see that in the northern half of the state, there are these diagonal running ridges across the top. And it turns out that there are designated hawk watch platforms throughout northern New Jersey on these various mountain ridges where people count raptors as they pass by these spots in the fall. And I got my start at Chimney Rock Hawk Watch, which is the southernmost point of the Watchung Mountains. Some of the other hawk watches in northern New Jersey you can see on this map as well. So for the most part, while migration can potentially occur from late August all the way to, to December, in general, the Migration of most hawks occurs in mid-September to mid-October. And north to northeast winds are the best days that follow uh, a cold front. So if you're planning on going to a hawk watch, that's the best time to go. Now, the hawks, are their route, their migration route, is clearly defined by geography and topography. So mountains that run north to south have crosswinds that hit the ridges and create nice updrafts that the hawks use for soaring. This is really important to save energy and migration. So our, our adult hawks, especially broad wing, sharp shin, and red-tailed hawks, will use these mountain ridges for migration routes. Sometimes they come in conflicts with wind turbines on certain mountain ridges. But for the most part, this is a very efficient process for their migration route. Then of course, there are also coastline hawk watches, most notably the one in Cape May in the fall. Now, with regards to coastlines, hawks don't like to cross open water where there's no updrafts, no good area way for hawks to use that energy to their advantage. So hawks will look for the narrowest crossing possible over water and wait for the best weather to occur. And that's gonna happen at Cape May Point. They're gonna, all gonna be funneled there and try to cross the nar at the narrowest point across the Delaware Bay. And so most of the, our immature birds of prey, as well as harriers, and kestrels and ospreys will use this route, the coastal route. And it turns out that the Cape May to Delaware Bay crossing is the largest migratory flight of raptors in all of North America. About 50,000 birds per year pass through this spot. There are some kinds of raptors that are resonant in our area of New Jersey, like turkey vultures, red-tailed hawks, and peregrine falcons that are actually migratory in other areas. So if they live in northern regions of North America, they need to migrate to
to find food in the winter. So they will actually sort of leapfrog over our resident birds and overwinter further south, as you can see on some of these maps. And our sharp shin hawks recently started showing changes in their migration patterns, which uh, basically means they're, they're overwintering here when they used to not be doing that. They used to overwinter further further south, but now they're overwintering here uh, basically because we have milder winters and we have abundant bird feeders and they eat small birds. So they're able to not migrate as far. Now, a really good question is what happens in the spring? All of these birds are migrating through New Jersey in the fall, but we don't see them in the spring migration. So where are they? And the answer to that is has to do with geography again. And in the springtime, the wind conditions are very different. And of course, the geographic orientation is reversed. So many of our birds of prey are not seen in the east. They're much further inland, flying along the Mississippi River corridor or west of the Appalachian Ridge. And the biggest uh, crossing in the springtime is basically an upside down Cape May Peninsula. And that's the peninsula that you see um, in Michigan adjacent to Lake Superior. The only springtime hawk watch in New Jersey is that of Sandy Hook, which is again the, a different orientation. It's facing, it's pointing northwards instead of south. And so there's a small crossing from uh, Sandy Hook over towards New York in the spring. Vultures are nature's garbage men. They eat dead animals. They're masters of sanitation. Without them, we would have a lot of smelly, decaying animals everywhere. And they're also masters of soaring. They are super efficient in the way they ride the thermals, which are those warm updrafts of air they can glide without expending hardly any energy, and they rarely flap. Vultures have bald heads, so they have no messy feathers when sticking their head into a carcass. Vultures will roost together in large groups, and they don't build nests. They will lay their eggs on the ground, inside stumps, or often inside abandoned buildings. Turkey vultures specifically the one you see in the picture, are very strongly two-tone wings that are silver on the bottom, black on the top, and they'll often tip and rock in the slightest breeze, holding their wings in a distinct V pattern, which is easy to remember, V for vulture. Turkey vultures will also often find carrion within two to three days, as they are one of the only birds with a sense of smell. The immatures do not have red heads, as you can see in the picture below. The turkey vulture is the most common of the two species of vultures found here, and they're resident in New Jersey. Sometimes you'll see vultures holding their wings wide open which looks kind of eerie. This isn't just to dry their wings. It's to burn off parasites that they might pick up when feeding on dead animals. Here you can see they have angled their wings directly into the sun. And here's another picture. Black vultures are the other species of vulture that we have in Burlington County. They have black wings with white wing tips. So that's quite different from the two-tone turkey vulture. And uh, they have a slightly different flight pattern. They don't have as much of a V in their wings and their, their tail is much shorter. They are generally outnumbered by turkey vultures in the United States. They can't smell as well as the turkey vultures, and they will look for the turkey vultures as they're soaring around, which will help lead them to food. 
there are some documentations of black vultures feeding on live prey, but generally it's those that are sick or injured. This species uh, is a southern species, but it's definitely expanding its range northward. And since they don't tip or rock as much in flight like the turkey vultures, they are more likely to be confused with eagles than turkey vultures. And eagles have a very similar uh, wing pattern in flight. And they both have very large wingspans. Also, as you can see in these photos, the black vulture is definitely much darker than the turkey vulture. If you see the turkey vulture, it definitely has brown in the feathers in the sun. And the adults and immatures of black vultures have gray faces and gray legs and feet. Okay, now we're going to look at different kinds of hawks. The first is the osprey. This is a bird that specifically feeds on live fish. Its, its name literally means fish hawk. It's an incredible bird of prey that obviously lives near water bodies. And they'll use dead tree snags or many times are artificial nest platforms to put their nests on or even channel markers and buoys. In fact, 72% of ospreys in New Jersey rely on man-made nest structures. They always carry fish head first and align with their body for the best aerodynamics possible. They're extremely efficient in catching fish and they have very specialized adaptations on their talons. They have barb pads on the bottom for holding on to slippery fish and one of their toes is reversible which allows them to grasp prey properly and hold it again aerodynamically. We see them in New Jersey from March to October and then they won't leave and migrate. Our, our birds that we had here will generally migrate somewhere towards Florida and the Gulf of Mexico and the immatures that were hatched this this year will migrate as far as South America which you'll see on the next slide. And this is their overall range map in the Americas and they definitely use those rising warm updrafts we call thermals whenever possible to save energy while looking for a fish. Females can be de determined from males by the fact they have a kind of dark necklace uh, on, their, on their neck. And ospreys in general, when you see them in flight, they form a sort of M shape because they have their wings bent, what we call the wrist, right where that arrow is showing. So they resemble the shape of a gull in flight. The other birds of prey don't have this M shape in flight. So this is one particular incredible journey of an immature osprey that hatched in Martha's Vineyard. And this was uh, tracked by Cornell. You can read more about it on the All About Birds website. But the Osprey was fitted with a 0.75 ounce solar power powered satellite transmitter on the back of her body. She was only three months old and starting at Martha's Vineyard, she flew alone 2,700 miles to French Guiana in just 13 days, never obviously having done any kind of migration before, which is just incredible. You can see the map here of her journey. Basically, it's it's amazing that she can can navigate to such a far away location. And when immatures arrive in the northern part of South America, they will stay there for 
18 months or so because they, they can't nest when they're when they're juveniles so there's no point in them returning to the the, the northeast of North America to nest so they'll stay in South America until it's time until they're mature and then they'll return to our area and on this slide you can just see they have pretty incredible worldwide distribution Ospreys have had quite a history in New Jersey they were once abundant and then they started to see huge declines around 1890 mostly due to habitat loss and collection of their eggs shooting various various issues and they continued to decline and once DDT was introduced in 1946 to kill mosquitoes, they really took a hit. These, these incredible predators, as you'll see on the next slide, were subject to these chemicals building up in the food chain. By the time it got all the way up to the top predators, like ospreys, uh, it wasn't, the chemicals didn't kill them, but it made their eggshells so thin that none of their young could survive. And so we started seeing huge losses in various kinds of birds of prey, but especially osprey, eagles, uh, birds that tend to eat aquatic animals. And then when DDT was banned in New Jersey in 1968, we started seeing um, various conservation efforts like the New Jersey Endangered Species Act, and um, the osprey was actually the first to be added to the endangered species list and it was unbelievably the first to be removed in 1985 in New Jersey. These slides show how very small amounts of toxin in the food chain will build up as more and more animals eat them. So in other words there's very small amounts of toxin in the very tiny creatures but then those are eaten by many kinds of aquatic insects which eat lots of phytoplankton and the fish eat lots of aquatic insects and so on and so forth and that increasing toxin as it goes up the food chain is known as bioaccumulation this chart shows it in a different way where the DDT is in the water in an extremely small amounts by the time it goes through the food chain the osprey winds up with an incredible amount more than what originally existed in the water and now as I said the osprey is an amazing conservation success story they we've built lots and lots of nesting platforms for them and they've taken very well to all along the, the coast of the Atlantic Ocean and along some of our other rivers like the Delaware and my husband uh, monitors Osprey and occasionally bans them here you can see him at one of the Osprey platforms in the Delaware Bay and this is a picture I took of the Osprey chicks at the in the, in the nest so they're just absolutely amazing they have bright orange eyes when they're young turned yellow when they become adults so this is the graph that shows the number of nesting pairs in New Jersey starting in the 1970s when there were just about 60 pairs and then once DDT was banned and they were protected under the Endangered Species Act they have their numbers have been climbing ever since and now we're around 670 pairs in New Jersey uh, next I'm going to talk about bald eagles which their story is similar to Osprey they are mostly prefer fish but they'll eat just about any other kind of prey they can get they will often steal fish from osprey and as I said they'll eat just about any other kinds of food they can get they'll eat 
uh, dead animals as well as ducks or rodents or other kinds of mammals. And they tend to perch and instead of soaring like a lot of other hawks to find their food. And they don't get their characteristic white head and tail until after they're four years of age. So the immatures are brown and mottled and you can age them if you are familiar with their plumages when they're under four years old. They nest in very large trees, usually near the water, but sometimes in very giant open fields. These are pictures of eagles that I took in the various county parks. The only place where we have eagles nesting is south of our fairgrounds property, which uh, this eagle on the right is perched on one of the fairgrounds light poles. And this eagle uh, photo was taken at Smithville Park. You can see eagles now in just about every county park, certainly anywhere near water or an open field. Eagles are resident in our area of New Jersey, but there are many migratory eagles that pass through and actually overwinter in various areas of New Jersey where there are very large open water bodies like the Delaware Water Gap and the Delaware Bay. So the, the time when we have the most bald eagles in New Jersey is the, the colder months in the winter time when we have both resident and overwintering migratory eagles. This photo shows a first year bald eagle. So you can see it's chocolate brown and has a little bit of white modeling under its wings, but no white on the head at all. And here's another, another view uh, that I took of it in flight. And you can see that coloration and the pattern. And remember, if, if you see a bird rocking or flapping in a hurried motion, it's definitely not an eagle. If you see a bird that's rocking or tipping, that's a vulture. And if you see a bird flapping in a hurried motion, that's going to be one of our other hawks. But eagles do not do that. They glide with their wings flat. Like the osprey, the bald eagle is definitely a conservation success story for New Jersey. Before 1940, habitat destruction, shooting, and poisonings had already greatly reduced the bald eagle population in our area. And then, as back in the early 1970s, when DDT was very heavily in the environment, there was just one pair in Cumberland County that continued to lay eggs but had such thin shells that they weren't viable. Those eggs were taken and incubated and hatched in the lab and they continued to have to foster eggs in this way until 1989. It wasn't until 1983 that state biologists instituted a breeding project resulting in the release of 60 young eagles mostly from Canada. And it was through these efforts that the bald eagle finally recovered. As you can see, it was no recovery until the 90s. And now a soaring success with an incredible 153 pairs nesting in New Jersey in 2017, producing at least 190 young. And there were actually 238 nests reported in 2019 in New Jersey. And these are all numbers from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And this is a page from the Endangered Non-Game Species Report, which shows the location of various eagle nests in New Jersey. And you can see that an enormous majority are located in the Delaware Bay, and there's about 12 nests in Burlington County, mostly along rivers like the Delaware River or the Rancocas or the Molucca. Our next bird of prey is the Northern Harrier. 
These are really interesting hawks that we see over open fields and also large wetlands like marshes. <clears throat> and they are excellent hunters. They fly low over the grasses and you'll see they have a long rectangular tail and one of the best field marks is the white rump patch, which is easy to see from a distance. And they have a facial disc that's very similar to owls. And that's for hearing the slightest movements of rodents in the grasses. These are generally migratory in our area, but we see them for a long time. So they arrive in the fall, they're here for the winter, and then they stay for a while in the spring. So the only time we really don't see them is in the middle of the summer when they prefer to breed further north. They nest on the ground and they used to nest in New Jersey, but due to rising sea levels and habitat loss, they have shifted their nesting range. The next group of hawks are known as excipiters. These are small, agile hawks that hunt small birds in the woods. And the two species we have in Burlington County are the Sharpshin and the Cooper's hawks. These are really hard to tell the difference. So a lot of times you might just say they're some type of exhibitor. And they have, as you can see, short rounded wings and a tail that's long and narrow. The Sharpshin hawk uses very rapid wing beats followed by a glide. And the, the wing beats are so fast that you couldn't count them if you tried. Whereas the Cooper's hawk beats its wings in quick succession followed by a glide, but you, the, the wing beats are such that you could actually, they're slower, you could count them if you, if you tried. So, uh, the, the Coopers and the Sharpshins are, as I said, almost, they look very, very similar. <clears throat> and Cooper talks are a little more common throughout the entire year in Burlington County as opposed to the Sharpshins. The Coopers hawks are bigger than Sharpshins. <clears throat> and because they're bigger, they can catch larger prey. And Coopers hawks are known to catch and be able to kill uh, chickens and because of that they have been condemned for a long long time and so when uh, Cooper's hawks killed chickens the hawks were shot uh, because of this and also DDT decimating their numbers Cooper's hawks were very much declining in our area but now their numbers are increasing and becoming more common in suburban areas like ours and they feed primarily on morning doves and pigeons in more developed areas. So this just shows how the Sharpshin and the Coopers look so much alike. The adults have a grayish back with a rusty barring on the front and the immatures are brown with vertical straight streaking on the front. And then really the only difference is that the Sharpshin is smaller, the Coopers are larger, but there's quite a variation depending on if they're male or female. And the Sharpshin has a little more squared off tail, whereas the Coopers has a more rounded tail. And this is a photo of a Coopers hawk chick that nested at Smithville Park. So we looked at the exhibitors. They were small, they had small kind of rounded wings and sort of rectangular tails. This group of hawks are the Budios and they have very broad wings and a fan tail. And you could see that all of these hawks have that similar pattern through their wings and tail. Very different from the group that we just looked at. The red-tailed hawk is the one that you're most likely to see all over Burlington County. They are found in open woods, fields, and roadsides. They prefer to eat rodents, but they're very opportunistic and will eat whatever, whatever they want, really. And they are very adaptable to our developed areas and suburbia. 
The adults and immatures look similar except for the tail. They don't get the red tail until after they're one year old. So I'll show you some pictures of the young ones in just a bit. These are definitely the most common bird of prey in North America. You can see on the map, they're found all throughout North America. And there's various subspecies and color variations depending on where you are in the country. These are pictures of immature red-tailed hawks that I took in the parks. And you can see they don't have the red tail yet, but they do have that distinctive band across their front. Here's another photo of an immature red tail taking off from a tree in Amico. You can see no red tail yet. So those are immature red-tailed hawks. The other members of the Budio group are much less common. So I won't spend as much time on them, but you could always pause the video and look and study them more. The red-shouldered hawk is usually found near wetlands. And you can see that those white, uh, those white sort of moon or crescent shaped patterns on the wings are a good field mark in flight. And they have these sort of banded appearance on their tail. These have definitely been declining in our area, mainly due to habitat loss and the decline of most of their prey. This is a photo of a red-shouldered hawk that I took on an extremely cold January day at Amico Island. And you can see it's very puffed up. They don't usually look this puffy, but it was so cold. And a lot of times birds will puff their feathers up like this to conserve energy and stay warm. The broadwing hawk is a, a relatively small beautio that's found in deciduous woods. It prefers to eat herps like snakes and amphibians. And these are migratory. These are hawks that pass through thousands at a time, usually in mid-September, across those mountain ridges I mentioned earlier. We don't see too many of these inland in, in Burlington County. And then there's the rough-legged hawk, which is a, a highly migratory hawk that lives most of the year in very far Arctic tundra. It has these feathers that go all the way down its legs to keep it keep it warm in very cold environments. And sometimes in certain winters, we can see these if they migrate as far as New Jersey. We can find them in open fields or marshes in those colder months between December and March. And the next group of raptors are the falcons. And falcons have very different wings from the hawks we just looked at, their wings are very pointed, triangular or wedge-shaped. You can see very clearly in the picture on the left, they come to a very sharp point. The, the falcons have these malar stripes on their faces that looks kind of like sideburns. And there's three species of falcons found in our area at different times of the year which include the kestrel, that's the smallest, the merlin, which is a little bit bigger than a kestrel, and then the, the largest, which is the peregrine falcon. It turns out the peregrine falcon is actually the fastest animal recorded on Earth. When they're just flying normally and cruising, they reach speeds of about 40 to 55 miles per hour. But when hunting, they reach uh, a a situation that we call stooping, where they almost appear to fall out of the sky. They fold their wings back and, and drop. And as the peregrine reaches its prey, it can reach speeds varying from 100 to 273 miles per hour. So if we look at the American kestrel, this is the smallest bird of prey. It's about the size of a blue jay. And 
they are found in open farmland or grassland areas. They eat small rodents or large insects, like grasshoppers, and you'll often see them hovering for prey in the air as well. Their numbers are definitely declining and they're listed as threatened in New Jersey as of 2012. That's due to the fact that our grassland habitats are certainly declining. And they also require a certain kind of special nest cavity. They're known as secondary cavity, cavity nesters. And that means they can't make their own hole in a tree. They use an old woodpecker hole or other cavity in, in a tree. So that's the kind of nest site they need. And due to the limited nest sites combined with habitat loss and pesticides poisoning their prey, they are, their numbers are definitely not what they used to be. This is a really good picture of a kestrel shown sitting with blue jays for size comparison. You can see they're about the same and obviously the blue jays don't care anything about the kestrel. This is not a threat to them. The Merlin is a small brown falcon, a little bit bigger than a kestrel, and we only really see it during migration in the winter months in New Jersey. So generally the best time to see them is between December and March. You'll see them in various open areas with low vegetation, also along water bodies like the Rancocas Creek, and they do eat birds up to the size of a pigeon. Their numbers are currently improving. Finally, we come to the peregrine falcon. Unfortunately, the peregrine falcon was hit the hardest of all the birds of prey by DDT. They were considered extinct east of the Mississippi River by 1964. It was only through incredible reintroduction efforts in the 1980s and we have very slow recovery with about 32 active pairs today in the state of New Jersey. Most of them that we see in our area are nesting or near the bridge crossings on the Delaware River. Others nest on very tall buildings or towers near cities. And there's a few on natural cliffs. We don't have many natural cliffs in New Jersey, but the ones we do have all the way up in the top northeast corner of the state, there are a few nests there. So the peregrines have adapted to eating pigeons in cities and so have been able to nest on top of skyscrapers. You can watch the Jersey City Falcon Cam in the springtime at the web address below. These are pictures I took of immature peregrine falcons, which are most likely to be seen near the Delaware River. These pictures were taken at Amoco Island, and you can see these are immatures. They don't have the gray uh, adult coloration yet. Okay, so we have now looked at all of the raptors that are active during the day, which is known as diurnal. So now we're going to look at the raptors that are active at night, which is known as nocturnal. And those, of course, are the owls. Owls have very large heads with forward-facing eyes and these really neat facial discs that surround their eyes for excellent hearing allowing them to hear the tiniest movement, mostly of rodents in the forest, since there's not a lot of light, obviously, at night. They really rely on your hearing. They have asymmetrical placement of their ears, which also helps in pinpointing exact locations of prey. They usually have feathers all the way down their feet, and they have these really interesting serrated edges on the outside of their flight feathers, which allows them to fly completely silently so they can sneak up on their prey completely undetected. Owls 
can rotate their heads and necks as much as 270 degrees. Obviously, they can't turn their heads all the way around 360 degrees, so that would break their neck. They have 14 neck vertebrae compared to 7 in humans, which certainly makes their necks more flexible. They also have differently formed blood vessels from us that protect them from injury or cutting up the blood supply to the brain when they turn their neck so much. And the undigestible parts of their diet, like bones, fur, and teeth, are regurgitated into a pellet. So while owls are tough to see, you can sometimes see at least signs of owls by looking for owl pellets on the ground. This is the barn owl. Beautiful owl we really don't get to see very often at all. These birds are found in open farmland, mostly, and they eat small mammals like rodents, an incredible mouse. They're found on really every continent except Antarctica, and they mate for life. I should mention that not all of our birds of prey mate for life. In fact, it's just the barn owl, the great horned owl, which we'll see on the next slide, the bald eagle, that are definite pairs that mate for life. There are some other large birds that mate for life, but not necessarily the hawks and other birds we talked about today. There's ravens and uh, albatross, cranes, swans, and geese. Those all, all mate for life as well. So this is the great horned owl. Great horned owls are massive and they can eat pretty much anything they can get, even other owls. They're really quite common throughout all of North America in a wide variety of habitats, especially suburban areas. They're very adaptable to, to humans and their environments. You even find them in urban areas. They don't build their own nests They'll use an abandoned nest of another large bird, like a hawk or heron, or find a, a tree cavity or an abandoned building. These are examples of some nests that we've had in the county parks. This is a great horned owl nesting at Longbridge in an old hawk nest. And here is a, a different great horned owl that nested at Smith's Woods again in an old hawk nest. And this is the owl with her chick a month later. So we actually have them in, in most of our parks. They're just so secretive. You're really lucky if you get to see them during the day. The next species of owl is the barred owl. And these are very uncommon. Most of the time, these owls are found in cedar swamps. They prefer that dense, mature, swampy woods that you find often in the heart of the pinelands. They nest in large tree cavities and eat a wide variety of prey. But due to habitat loss, they definitely became threatened in New Jersey as of 1979. The screech owl is a really tiny, cute owl that can be rusty red or gray. They always kind of look aggravated. <laughs> and this is a little chick. They eat very small animals like rodents and also large insects. They're widespread in the eastern half of the U.S. And they nest in tree cavities. They'll also use nest boxes that people put up for them. The sawwood owl is another very tiny owl that's very uncommon, and it's about the size of a robin. They nest in evergreens or sometimes a mix of deciduous and coniferous trees. They eat mostly small rodents like the screech owl. Again, very hard to see. They do migrate here from Canada in the wintertime when conditions are poor for hunting in the north. 
Another migratory owl is the long-eared owl. This one is like a smaller version of a great horned. It's about the size of a crow. And they prefer evergreens. We only really see them in the colder months in our area, Berlini County, from approximately December to March. Their numbers have declined. They're mostly, mostly small rodents. And here you can see their, their range map, resonant purple and uh, blue wintering grounds. One other migratory owl is the short-eared owl. So this bird nests mostly in the tundra, and we usually see it here again between December and March, wintering in open areas like farmland and open marshes. It's often seen at the same time as harriers hunting together at dawn and dusk over the same kind of habitat. They eat mostly rodents, and you can see that incredible facial discs help them to hear. And they actually occur also on just about all over the world. And while they're globally stable, they are endangered in the Northeast because they require such large tracts of undisturbed open areas. And the last possible owl that we could potentially see in New Jersey is the snowy owl. And these only occur in certain winters when particular conditions occur in the Arctic where they live most of the time. You can see on the range map, they're found in the Arctic tundra of Northern Canada and Northern Alaska. And when the, the lemmings or the ptarmigan that they hunt are either not abundant or what happened in the last couple of years when there was an abundance of prey, there were so many owls they had to spread out and some of the owls reached New Jersey, one of the southernmost part, possible parts of their winter range. But we certainly don't see them every winter in New Jersey. But if we are lucky enough to see them here, Good places to find them are certainly along shorelines, mostly along the Atlantic coast, as well as certain open places like farm fields and even airport fields. So in conclusion, we've learned that birds of prey are excellent predators and they help maintain the balance of our natural world by keeping small animals like rodents from overpopulating. They contribute to the overall health of our ecosystems and provide an indication of environmental health since many of them are very sensitive to pollutants. Here are some things you can do to help our birds of prey. You can donate to conservation organizations that help protect their habitat. You can volunteer to help observe raptors by watching kestrel nest, nest boxes, volunteering to monitor bald eagle nests, and also monitoring osprey nests. And you can find out more about that on Conserve Wildlife website as listed below. So I hope that this presentation helped you understand more about our birds of prey in Burlington County and gives you a better appreciation for these magnificent birds. Thanks for watching.